this juncture, let me introduce our moderator, Victor Root, who will take over from this moment and we'll start this wonderful discussion. And one more thing before I do that, I actually think of this panel as the, the baby panel. It's actually, this topic is very dear to my heart. And when I met Anastasia, it actually reminded me, remind me a lot uh, of my own experience when I was a student and came uh, to study in uh, pretty much the same universities. Um, and so when I heard about her story, I actually decided to do something about this. And of course, the wonderful organization Razum and Apukas, and we have Krizana Vora from Apukas, uh, supported this idea wholeheartedly. And um, so I, I really would love you to enjoy this as much as I do. And I think this topic is extremely important. And I think of this because of holiday season, this is our gift to you. Uh, and I don't think there can be better gift during the holiday season than intellectually provoking discussions of this nature. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm going to sit here. I'll be partially hidden, which is fine. You don't have to see me. You have to see the speakers. Uh, I'm going to do this in a little bit unorthodox manner. Typically, I want to expound on the background of the speakers, but we're starting late, and we have a pretty good bio on all of them on the flyer. Uh, so I invite your attention to that. Of course, uh, Anastasia was already introduced by uh, Irena. She's uh, really the catalyst for all of this. Uh, let me give you some framework and some random thoughts before we get into the presentations by the three presenters. Uh, there is a microbrewery that recently opened up outside of Boulder, Colorado. And uh, they have a beer that the label they put on the beer was Swastika Beer. And uh, Jay Carney, who is the former White House press secretary, he has Nazi propaganda posters in his house, and it was featured on the front page of a Washington, D.C. periodical. And there's a Gestapo bar in New York. Now, of course, none of that is true. Uh, and if it were true, then it would be met with predictable revulsion, ostracism, and alarm. Uh, but what is true is that there is swastika beer, excuse me, uh, hammer and sickle beer uh, being produced in Colorado. There is a KGB bar in New York, and Jay Carney in his house does have Soviet propaganda posters, which were featured on, uh, in a uh, Washington, D.C. weekend magazine publication. So the dichotomy is, most obviously, that there is absolutely no visceral reaction when we come to the issue of seeing or discussing uh, Soviet symbolism, whatever it may be. Whether it is imagery, whether it's music, uh, or whether it is behavior or conduct. Uh, for example, when Putin resurrected the Soviet anthem, the music anyway, the lyrics were different in 2001, nobody thought much of it, there was a big yawn. And that is essentially the reaction we have to Soviet symbolism which is either a yawn or maybe a smile. There's no alarm, there's no contrition, there's no disgust, there's no ostracism. And it's ironic for several reasons. One reason, of course, is that they're two sides of the same coin, in the sense that Stalin and Hitler were co-ventures, joint ventures, partners in the triggering of World War II, and then, of course, there are other reasons, so on and so forth. But that point aside, if we allow Soviet symbols, if we accept them passively without any negative reaction, to me it means one of two things. Either we are saying that what they represent and the past that they represent never happened, which is reality denial, or we acknowledge that it happened, but it really wasn't bad. Okay, choose your poison, it's one of the two. So what do Soviet symbols represent? Well, at least two things. 
One is what we're vaguely aware of, although not sufficiently, and that is there's something bad that they represent. It was a bad system somehow. A lot of people were killed, they were tortured, okay, but it's in the past, you know, leave me alone. The other thing that Soviet symbolism represents is a perverse genius of the system that engaged in the slaughter of the mind, the total evisceration of memory, the creation of a alternative reality, such that the symbol, whatever it may be, take the hammer and sickle, on the one hand it represents a catalog of horrors that I'm not going to march you through, but simultaneously that same symbol represents the whitewashing of all of that horror. Right? So what, what happens is you have through the symbolism, the elevation of despotism to a virtue. You have the substitution of a hologram for empirical reality, and despotism is elevated. Uh, if you really want to show how extreme things may become, and I'm not going to talk right now about the hammer and sickle, but an observation made by the first U.S. Ambassador Davies to the Soviet Union when he met Stalin. And you can take this and then extrapolate it out and you see the conclusion. Stalin gives the impression of a strong mind which is composed and wise. His brown eyes are exceedingly kind and gentle. A child would like to sit on his lap and a dog would sidle up to him. So that is, in addition to what I would say the catalog, the catalog of horrors, it is the perverse genius of the system that it was able to zombify people and create people, the very victims of that system, into the prime example of the Stockholm Syndrome where the victim not only uh, is only vaguely aware of his victimization, but in many cases denies it and actually will become rather agitated uh, when you try to point out to the victim that he is a victim. Now, that is a process that slowly is being shed in Ukraine, but really after more than 20 years of independence. So you really have to wonder about the genius and the staying power of the system. That 20 years of independence is only now in Ukraine that it is being shed in Russia, it's a different story, and we're going to hear about it. So what you say, it's nice, it's interesting, it's an academic exercise for us, but it's not, because it is terribly relevant to us. And the relevance is uh, simply this, that Moscow, unlike Germany, has not rejected that symbolism, it has not been condemned. Uh, there is no admission of liability, there's no apology, there's no contrition. We have the very opposite. We have the resurrection, we have the deification of Stalin and the symbolism that represents him and the system that he represented. And that is not good. Back to the USSR, as the Beatles sang, is not something that I welcome. I do not want to go back to those days, particularly now, where if we are confronted by the same type of Russia that we were confronted by when it was Russia together with the other republics with the Soviet Union. Now we have terrorism in the Middle East, we have China, we have North Korea, and everything else. So when we see the symbolism not only being still extant, but now being even accelerated, I think it's time to worry and it's time for us to dig a little bit into it and what is happening in the Soviet Union and of course based on the background of our panelists it will be primarily Ukraine and Russia. So thank you very very much and I'm going to ask uh, Emily to kick this off perhaps if you can. Excuse me, Nasya, obviously, my apologies. The, the person who I introduce as the catalyst for all this of course. Uh, Nasya, uh, I will tell you as it says in the background, she comes from the city of Kharkiv which is the second largest city in Ukraine, and which was the arch-typical uh, Soviet city 
and suffered grievously uh, during Soviet rule. And it is interesting and encouraging that uh, the young generation growing up in Kharkiv uh, really, in this case, is the catalyst for the conferences and is in the forefront of this, at least for the, uh, tonight's session. So Nasa, thank you very, very much, and please, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am very honored to present this discussion. I would like to start by saying, saying what I believe and I hope that this point will become clearer as we discuss it today, that this issue of Soviet symbols remains very pertinent. And as you will see from the case that I will present, how I encountered uh, this situation, uh, you will understand that this issue is pertinent uh, a lot to student groups at universities around the world. It is pertinent currently to Ukraine in how the country is trying to establish its new course in the information politics. And it is pertinent to the American society and the world as a whole. Why? Because if we do not treat properly this issue, then the history might turn back and the Cold War may appear again. How did I encounter this case? At my university, New York University in Abu Dhabi, uh, one of the students, uh, proposed to hold a Slavic night and uh, motivated it uh, as an event where countries from uh, Eastern Europe and the region could present their cultures. So at first I thought, well, why not? Uh, sure, I can play a Ukrainian song on the guitar, why not? Uh, the agenda of the event, however, wasn't very clear. And as we got closer to the event, we started wondering uh, from this organizer, so what's it, the event going to look like? What, uh, who, who is the audience going to be, what are, what are the issues on the agenda, nothing was clear. And then one, just the evening before the event, the posters spoke up on the whole campus. And on the poster you see a Soviet soldier pointing a finger in a typical war propaganda poster saying, uh, are you coming to the Slavic night, which is the rhetoric of are you joining the war. Uh, and. I searched on the internet and the actual poster also has the guns on the sides, but those guns weren't there because they were hidden in, by the words uh, to advertise the event. Uh, and uh, the Soviet star was replaced by the NYUED logo. All these controversial issues in one poster and no time to discuss this issue. Uh, I did not like it that uh, my country, my identity would be represented by a Soviet soldier inviting people to come to the event. So for this reason, I abstained from it, did not participate, uh, and the people who went to the event later told me that uh, on the event there were more Soviet posters with different propaganda messages such as quiet the enemy is listening and so on. How is that relevant to represent the countries of, the, of Eastern Europe? And that made me feel very insulted, first of all, because the history of the Soviet Union is a very painful uh, history in my country, as I will tell you. And the second, this event happened last April, which was exactly the time when Russia was invading Crimea. So uh, this was completely insensitive. Uh, I abstained from the event, and um, I understand that the audience here does not come primarily from and it's important to understand why Soviet symbols are so hurtful. Um, I felt it through my family and through the history of my country. My family during the Soviet times could not go to church because this was prohibited. They had to pray secretly. Now imagine this in modern times. My family, uh, my grandparents, uh, spent 30 years of their lives toiling uh, in uh, one of those um, collective fields, it was obligatory. All their energy went into that, 30 years. And now they really feel this on their health condition. Well, I learned a lot from my Ukrainian language and literature class back at high school, from history class, uh, definitely the genocide, which is not uh, properly accounted for even nowadays. 
uh, figures vary to how many people were killed, but the figures are millions. Can you imagine in millions people died? The Soviet regime deliberately uh, killed those who tried to defend their belongings and their identity. Uh, I learned that more than 500 in the Ukrainian intellectuals who tried to revive Ukrainian culture, preserve the country, were killed or tortured in the labor camps. And when we're talking about the Soviet Union becoming more kind or more open to discussion, as let's say 1989 when Gorbachev was talking about perestroika, this is so interesting, that in that year, a uh, great Ukrainian poet, Vasily Stus, a political prisoner, died far away in the prison. Nobody really heard about that. The Iron Curtain. Should it come back? We should really tackle this issue. So, uh, for these reasons, I felt very, very insulted, um, in a bit insecure to how the issue is handled. So, I went on to engage in a conversation with the administration at NYU Abu Dhabi. And uh, I wrote an article for the university newspaper. Uh, to talk more about the issue, and there were two things that I learned. First of all, uh, many students at university were not aware at all why um, Soviet, the Soviet symbols uh, contained any harmful messages. So after the newspaper article came out, many of them actually approached me and said, thank you very much, now I'm more aware of the issue, I didn't know about it at all. Uh, second of all, I learned that administration of the school board wasn't really aware why uh, this was a problem, why this event was a problem. So I explained to the administration uh, uh, why this was a hurtful issue to me. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful to the administration of NYU Abu Dhabi that they facilitated the discussion. Uh, but I believe that there is much more work and monitoring that has to be done on this issue. Uh, why? Because I, I read and heard from many of my friends that apparently uh, this is not the case that happened on my university. It happened in a North American universities everywhere. There are so many of those Slavic clubs or something else clubs which uh, claim to represent the identity of their region, but then everything comes down to brandishing Soviet symbols, uh, and many people don't agree to that, and the issue has not been tackled well. Um, and the same is the case in Europe. Uh, there are, uh, the symbols uh, are not responsibly used as, let's say, uh, King's College at Cambridge where they put up the Soviet flag in the bar and many people opposed to that, and there was a real debate. Um, so I would really like to see that uh, the administration at schools, because I think it's so important to start the conversation at university, first of all, because this happens a lot at universities, but also because university is a venue where students learn to become individuals, to become responsible for what they're doing. So that's why I think that school administrations at educational institutions should really try to promote uh, uh, people getting to know the issue. They should try to make students aware uh, of the issue uh, so that they use the symbols more responsibly. And uh, I hope that, uh, that there will be a, discipli a disciplinary action taken to those who intentionally use the symbols despite seeing that this makes others in the community feel hurt and inferior. Uh, so, on this note, I would like to conclude and say that this issue is very important to the current development uh, of agenda in Ukraine and how Ukraine is going to tackle its Soviet legacy. This is very important to uh, the development of mindset of students on campuses. This is very important to the rural community. Because if this issue is not tackled, the, the Soviet symbols are going to be revived. There are people who would like that. You probably understand. And we do not want the Cold War or any other issues associated with those to come back. Thank you. I think what we're going to do is perhaps um, hold the questions until uh, the other two panelists finish, and then we can have uh, questions from the floor addressed to one or more of them. We start a little bit late, so let's just keep on clicking along here. Uh, Emily, maybe if you could uh, please pick up now. Sure. <clears throat> um, oh, yes, I have a small presentation. Uh,
Um, so my name is Emily Channel Justice. I'm an adjunct lecturer, lecturer in anthropology here at John Jay College. Can you speak this on the mic? Yes. Yes. Is that better? Yeah. Yep. I'm very awkward about <laughs> microphones. Yeah, I, I hear so so much of the feedback. It's strange. Is that better? I'll try this one. Okay. This is taller. Okay. Is that better? Better? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this never so I'm just okay. I'll try to speak loudly as well as into the microphone. Okay, so like I said, I'm an anthropologist, um, and and uh, so I, I don't have any history or family background in Ukraine, um, but I think that's a very heartfelt story, um, which I think kind of gives us a really good background to talk more about this issue. So my goal in my paper that I've prepared, which I'll read a little bit more than just talking. Apologists have a habit of doing that. Um, so my goal is to kind of ask the question of why are the symbols important and why are the things that they represent things that are important now in comparison to the last 20 years of Ukrainian history where, as we've seen, they've just sort of been kind of part of the background. Um, so I was doing research in Ukraine for last year. Uh, I started research in September of 2013 where I had a beautiful research plan that I threw out the window on November 21st, um, as you can imagine, which is the beginning of um, the year went down mobilizations, um, and I uh, wasn't there to witness Lenin coming down, but I visited the site the day after, and so I'm using the moment of Lenin's fall and the kind of domino effect that it had across Ukraine as my sort of case study. Um, and it's very interesting, as you can probably recall, we're just about a year outside of uh, Lenin's, Lenin's fall, so I kind of thought that was a little serendipitous. Um, and as most of you probably know, also I'm talking about the Lenin statue that was on Vesovsky Square. Um, and the statue had been built in 1946. Um, and its fall, which happened on December 8th of 2013, set off a chain of events, which as you know is called Lenin Lopad, um, which comes, for those of you who don't speak Ukrainian, from the Snipopad, which is snowfall, um, or any other kind of you know, weather falling. Um, and so it kind of evokes this idea of falling linens all over the country. And most recently, this was in Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine, which is the first state of the town. Um, so my question really is, oh, let me see this, I think it's, so my question is, what about the Euromaidan protest led to Leninopad that no other mobilization has thus far been able to do in Ukraine? And I'm going to attempt to answer this question by framing the paper around anthropological studies of dead body politics which has been a powerful phenomenon in lots of post-socialist spaces. And so I'm going to describe a little bit Lenin's history in Ukraine as a statue, um, and how it became more than just a symbol of the founder of the Soviet Union. Um, his destruction during the Maidan process is part of the writing of new historical narratives about Ukraine, uh, in which Ukraine's communist past is completely rejected. Lenin's pre presence prevents Ukraine's redefinition, while his destruction in various cities and towns in Ukraine is a claim for inclusion and solidarity with new narratives. So as I said, I based my analysis and my field research in Ukraine during the Maidan protests, um, and also some analysis of news and other media discussions about the destruction of Lenin across Ukraine. So why is it that dead bodies and their inanimate representations like Lenin's statues matter? Catherine Verdery, in her widely read book, work, The Political Lives of Dead Bodies, suggests that statues falling was one of the earliest visible signs of regime change in 1989. She describes Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and others being pulled down from their pedestals, and the statues of historical national heroes that took their places. Um, as statues, suggests Verdry, they are more than just bronze or stone, the bronze or stone that forms them. So they're more than just the bronze or stone that forms them. They symbolize a specific famous person while also, in a sense, being the body of that person. By arresting the process of that person's bodily decay, a statue alters the temporality associated with the person, bringing him into the realm of the timeless or the sacred like an icon. And therefore, the removal of the statue removes that specific body from the landscape as if to excise it from history. These dead bodies, as Verdery claims, are useful and effective symbols for revising the past, not only because they helped early post-Soviet regimes reject the immediate communist past, but also because such historical revision is an essential part of the historical transformation that happens after socialism. So Verdery sees that a changing political order often means changing the bronze human beings who both stabilize the landscape and temporarily, te sorry, temporally freeze particular values in it. 
So as I said before, London's statue in Kiev was built in 1946, and it was the first full-size uh, monument to the Soviet leader in the capital. So there were other busts, just his head and shoulders, but this is the first actually full-scale one. Um, so various large-scale projects to build a monument to Lenin were planned in different parts of the city, but ultimately the monument was placed uh, at the end of Khrushchev Street where it meets Shevchenko, which I've circled in red on this map, um, and I've also put a big circle in blue, which is where my down is, and this is where the, most of the mobilizations are, just to give you a sense of where Lenin is in proximity to those mobilizations. Um, and there was the big competition to see who would win, the, the, be the person to build the statue, um, these two twin Lenin and Stalin statues were exhibited at the 1939 World's Fair in New York. Um, this is an artist's rendering of that moment, and this is the statue that ends up um, on Khrushchev. And as many of you probably know, in the 1990s and 2000s, the Kiev City Council attempted multiple times to get the statue removed legally. This was the only way to do it, um, but every one of those attempts thus far failed. So, so, thank you. so it's easy to understand the recent removal of Lenin's statue in Kiev and beyond as a moment of historical revisionism that was necessary to fully transform Ukraine into a post-socialist, non-communist world. But Verdery's suggestion that statues, quote, stabilize the land landscape and freeze particular values in it, end quote, is actually more provocative. We can consider that Lenin's presence in Kiev was perceived as a legitimation or even a nostalgia for communist values. So if we take Verdery's suggestion that statues are the timeless representations of famous bodies, and if we take Lenin's body as a st and statue as a symbolic version of the Communist Party itself, then Lenin confirms the timelessness of the Soviet regime in Ukraine. So in order to definitively show Ukraine's post-Soviet status, Lenin must be removed and destroyed. Why did this only happen in 2013? The Euromaidan mobilizations, which were mass gatherings on Kiev's Independent Square, began in November 2013 in response to President Viktor Yanukovych's refusal to sign the association agreement with the European Union uh, and to instead join Russia's customs union, which is generally understood as the rapprochement with Putin. Uh, the protests expanded after November 30th when students sleeping on the square were beaten and arrested by riot police under Yanukovych's orders. So these events led to the months-long occupation of the square and eventually to the standoffs between protesters in January and February which resulted in the deaths of at least 100 people. So Lenin's downfall begins in December. The first attempt on his life was on December 1st, and during a mass march on December 2nd, which is the photo on the left, uh, riot police protected the statue from the protesters, because they really thought that they would take it down. Um, but on the late at night, on December 8th, protesters were very easily be able to bring down Lenin's body with just a few cables. I'm sure many of you have seen the video of this. Um, the following weeks, uh, Lenin's beheaded body lay below the pedestal, always with a small crowd around it, hacking away with tiny hammers, trying to get big, as big pieces as possible as they could off of his body, many of which uh, off, off, often ended up on eBay or Ukrainian versions of eBay. Um, and eventually, the body was removed. I don't know what happened to it. I tried to follow it. Uh, and so now there's just a kind of gaping hole where his head hit the concrete, and that is all that remains of Lenin. And soon after Lenin's fall, the right-wing nationalist party Svoboda, or Freedom, claimed responsibility for planning and executing Lenin's destruction. At this point in the mobilizations in December, the Svoboda party, along with the two other opposition parties of Ludad and Batyshina, they remained the leaders of the protests. While these parties and their leaders lost most of their credibility over the course of the winter and throughout the protests uh, because of their attempts to compromise with the ruling regime, I find that Svoboda's claim to have finally downed Lenin significant because this party has been at the forefront of Ukraine's nationalist movement since the 1990s. Um, it didn't gain seats in parliament until 1988. But their rhetoric has always targeted the communist past of Ukraine as an explanation for current difficulties and suggesting that a nationalist alternative which promotes a unified version of a Ukrainian nation state, is the answer. Um, so I find that the destruction of Lenin is a convenient symbolic moment for the Svoboda Party's already determined project. So taking advantage of the general anti-communist sentiment, which journalist Andriy Mokchad has suggested was a stronger unifying sentiment on Maidan than any nationalist or pro-European rhetoric, Svoboda's so claim to have finally killed Lenin was a way for them to present themselves as the answer to protesters' demands and desires, 
And so whether or not their claim that they actually did this is true doesn't matter because they used it as a possibility to present themselves as the legitimate new leaders of Ukraine. Because they couldn't legally remove Yanukovych or any other political leader from office, they certainly could destroy the last remaining vestiges of state socialism from Kiev's geography. But what does this new narrative, which is very centered on anti-communism, uh, mean for Ukraine's future? I suggest the importance of being aware of the dangers of erasing any kind of history, including its representations. Pulling Lenin down does not mean that his legacy in Ukrainian politics and society simply disappears. The lustration or cleansing of party officials from Yanukovych's party or coalition member, members does not erase their role in the current and deteriorating situation in Ukraine today. And dismantling a whole party, as interim President Turchinov attempted to do to the Ukrainian Communist Party, is not the sign of a successful democracy. So in other words, this historical narrative is also a political project, and what has happened with Lenin's bodies across Ukraine should continue to remind us of that. So I want to end this, this presentation with an anecdote. It should serve as a reminder that all experiences are multivocal, they have lots of participants, and this new historical narrative should remember that it might not always represent everyone in Ukraine. I visited Lenin's former home many times throughout the winter, waiting to see what would happen with the body and the pedestal and everything uh, around it. So a few months after this, I watched this old woman who's in this photo with a plastic bag came up the stairs to this graffiti-filled pedestal and she began to pull flower petals out of her plastic bag. And they were clearly gathered. They weren't called flowers. She hadn't bought them. And she began to strew them around the base of the entire statue very methodically, very slowly. And then she walked away. And I felt that this was very obviously an act of mourning. And I wondered what had happened in her life that she would perform this sort of rite for someone like Lenin, who had been, <coughs> everybody was celebrating the fact that he was down. What made it possible for this woman to still be mourning about Lenin? Something in her life remembered something good about the part that Lenin represented. So even if we can't comprehend a memory like this ourselves, we do a disservice to treat it as if it doesn't matter. History and that writing is a biased process, and I know that as post Maidan Ukraine tells a new story about Ukrainian history, this woman's story is probably going to be left out. So we can celebrate the death of Lenin because he no longer represents a Ukrainian political project, but we should not forget about the ways others might see this new version if it ignores or erases their experiences. Whatever replaces Lenin in this spot, as something surely will, it will be another political body, which is mobilized to represent a worldview just like Lenin once was. And as those who recall Soviet times without bitterness face rejection from this new narrative, Lenin's destruction around Ukraine has been sort of a symbol of inclusion. Towns and cities in eastern Ukraine, which was the heart of the communist project, are showing solidarity by removing Lenin. But whether these cities will be an essential part of Ukraine's new narrative, or if they will be excluded because of their historical ties to the Soviet Union, remains to be seen. So I end with a question. Is the destruction of Lenin the new way to define oneself as Ukrainian? Thank you. Uh, a couple of observations in your presentation that I myself would want to follow up on uh, after the completion of the panel. But at this point, uh, Paul, uh, if we could have the benefit of your uh, insight, please. And then we can open it up to uh, across the board questions from the floor. And by the way, although I haven't asked anybody uh, to turn off your cell phones and I haven't heard any ringing, uh, please do so uh, just in case we get interrupted with. Or does it falls or something. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I have to start with the uh, note that I am not a Ukrainian or a Ukrainian specialist. Uh, I'm someone who has spent 40 years of his life tracking the oppression of the non-Russian peoples by Moscow. Uh, and what I want to do with my 10 minutes is to try to put uh, the issue of the destruction of Lenin statues in a broader context because what we are seeing in Ukraine is a very much larger issue than whether Lenin is up on this or that street corner. I think a good place to begin with, to understand this is August 22nd, 1991. On that date, three days after the coup began in Moscow, the governments of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania declared that they had achieved the recovery of their independence. And one of their very first acts was to decide to tear down the statue of Lenin, which stood in their capital cities. But being balls, they each went about it in 
its own way. In Lithuania, uh, President Landsbergis assembled a crowd of over 10,000 Lithuanians. He denounced Lenin, Moscow, Poland, America, other Lithuanians, and got everyone so angry that they ran over to where Lenin was standing, wrapped a rope around his neck, and pulled his statue into the street, smashing it. Meanwhile, in Riga on the same day, this story is actually true, uh, only is true, um, that the, uh, the Latvian government decided Lenin had to go, but the Latvians went about it in their way. They formed a commission of the best engineering talent at the state university to measure Lenin and f figure out how much he weighed and how large a crane and how large a truck they would need to lift Lenin off of his pedestal, put him in a truck, and drive him to the dump. And that night, after 7 o'clock, which is the end of the Riga rush hour, uh, they came and took Lenin away and drove him to his demise. In Estonia, the Estonian government also decided on that day that Lenin had to go, uh, but the Estonians had a problem. Unlike in Vilnius and Riga, the statue of Lenin in Tallinn was never on Parliament Square uh, because that's where there was a Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, but instead, it was down by the Olympia Hotel, which is where the Finns came to drink and do other things. And it was an area that the Estonians generally avoided. So no one in Tolpe at the, at the Parliament could remember how big Lenin was or what they'd have to do. So a group of five members of the Parliament were sent down the hill to look at Lenin's statue and look up at it. And my God, it was bigger than they remembered. So shaking their heads, they walked back up Tolpe Hill, not certain what they would do. And then they did what any self-respecting Estonian could be expected to have done. They picked up their satellite telephones, they called Helsinki and contracted with a Finnish firm to take <laughs> Lenin away. Now I tell you this story for uh, three reasons. First, the centrality of getting rid of Lenin is true across this entire region. The Soviet system was one of the most evil arrangements of political and social power we have ever seen in world history, and Lenin is the symbol of that. It was convenient for many people to blame Stalin for everything. Nothing Stalin did, Lenin didn't start. And it was understood by the people that to address the Soviet system, it was necessary to address Lenin. Stalin isn't enough because the crimes of the Soviet system began before Stalin took power, and they continued after Stalin died. And that was understood. The second thing is that the way in which you choose to get rid of Lenin is equally important to the getting rid of him. How you go about doing it matters. If the government issues an order to get rid of Lenin, it is behaving absolutely no differently than the Soviet system giving orders to put Lenin up. You do not de-Sovietize by using Soviet methods. There were a lot of people in the Baltic countries who were referred to as anti-Soviet Bolsheviks because they preferred to use Bolshevik measures because they were quick and easy, but they didn't in fact do a lot. Yes, you took down the statues, but you didn't take Lenin out of where it was more important, which was in the hearts and minds of a large part of the population. And the third point I want to make is that we make a huge mistake, uh, because we follow in the way journalists do reporting, of assuming that what happened in the capital city is what happens everywhere. Uh, very few Lenin statues or Leninist street names in the Baltic countries were changed in August of 1991. In Ukraine, the statue of Lenin is gone in Kiev. It is gone in Kharkiv and a few other places. But of the 4,500 statues of Lenin and the busts of Lenin that were in up in Ukraine on January 1st, 2014, more than half are still there. Of the more than 25,000 streets named for Lenin or other Bolshevik criminals, fewer than 20% have had their names changed. So while I'm delighted to see Lenin go away, I will tell you Lenin hasn't gone away and, is, and focusing on a single statue has the effect of overstating what has happened.
In fact, I can tell you this from the Baltic countries, the people who were most pleased in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania with the demise of Lenin's statue was the left, who saw that by getting him out of the way, a lot of the policies that Lenin would have liked could continue to be pursued without the point of anger that his statue would inevitably uh, represent. Now, Ukraine has faced an enormous challenge over the last 20 years. It is part of a, what is going on in Ukraine and the demise of Lenin statues and Lenin street names is part of something much bigger. What we are witnessing right now is the birth of a nation and to be born as a nation requires that you decide who and what you want to be and who and what you aren't. That is not easy. To create a nation is extraordinarily difficult. All too many American academics have learned to bleat that a nation is an imagined community. The idea being that it's an invented community. Well, nations are not simply invented. They are not imaginary. They are a combination of things, primordial ties, the choices the people themselves make, and the choices others make about them. But the problem is that if whatever causes a nation to come into existence are not nearly as interesting as the other part of this, and that is, what are the support systems for the symbols of a new nation. What is it that keeps that identity going? Why do you believe certain things? Why do more and more people believe it? What the Soviets were extraordinarily good at, arguably better than anyone in the history of the world, was creating support systems to promote symbols which promoted the values that they wanted to see promoted. To be blunt, what is true of the post-Soviet states is that they have not been good about coming up with a support system to promote the symbols that represent a genuine de-Leninization and de-communization. They do the easy things, but not the hard things. The easy thing, as we'll see in a minute, is taking down a statue. The hard thing is getting rid of the Bolshevik style of mind, which still informs a large number of Ukrainian political parties, including those on the far right. I would argue that the far right in Ukraine is more thoroughly penetrated by Moscow's agents, but also by Lenin's ideas, than the, than the center or the left. And that's something we're very uncomfortable with because we want the world to be simpler than it is. Okay. The process of for Ukrainians in building a nation, which is what we're watching at a terrible time when Ukraine has been invaded by Vladimir Putin's Russia, involves three interrelated things. First, to become a nation requires that you reject what you were before. In other words, if you're going to be an independent country, you can't accept what was there before. If you're going to be a separate nation, you have to reject the other nation that says it's your part of. That's the first thing. The second thing you have to do is you have to repurpose things that have been used by that system, redefining them so that you can use them for a democratic future rather than simply mirror image to the point of replication what is, what is present. And third, and this is the most important thing for Ukraine, it seems to me, Ukrainians have to do what they have not done yet which is to reclaim Ukraine from the Russian interpretation of what Ukrainians are and to reclaim Ukraine from what is the Western academic and intellectual interpretation of what Ukrainians are. They must, to put this very briefly, reclaim from Russia the idea that Ukrainians are a historical byproduct of Russian national development. That, my friends, is a total and complete lie. And it is believed by 99% of Americans in the AAAS. It's simply not true. There were no Russians in the 10th century. There were no Ukrainians in the 10th century, and there were no Belarusians in the 10th century. So for Russia to exist, as it does, that 
988 is about Russia and Kiev and Rus is about Russia is simply to say the same thing you could say as a British subject that it's all about Athens because Athens is British too. <laughs> like you better run, but still. The other thing, the other reclaiming that has to happen, and I'll say more about this in a minute, is from the West which tragically is driven by a Congress of Vienna mentality that treats Ukraine as one of the countries in between, as a country that didn't quite get, get, didn't quite make it. I became a nationality specialist because the professor I had in graduate school dismissed all Belarusians as, as he put it, the same way I would dismiss any other backward peasant anti-Semitic people. The contempt of the West for the people between Russia and Germany is palpable and explains a great deal. Now, first thing, rejection is easy. Tearing down a statue is easy. But how do you sustain it? And how do you prevent the destruction of the statue from becoming just another Bolshevik strategy? That does not mean that they will push for the same set of ideas associated with Lenin, but the idea of the imposition of a set of ideas by force and violence my friends, is exactly what Lenin was about. You don't achieve what you want when you take the, when your methods subvert your ends, you should change your methods. And it is terribly important to understand that the West has not been interested in having you, having Ukrainians reject all this. Why? Well, when the Soviet Union came apart, the Americans in particular, went through the usual stages that countries do when, and individuals do when confronted with change. The first is denial, the second is search for analogy, and the third, only laterally, is, is actually be empirical. Uh, you may not know, but the last place the Soviet flag flew officially in the entire world was at the U.S. Department of State, where it was kept up six days after it was taken down over the Kremlin, which qualifies the Foreign Service for Empire Loyalist League membership, uh, which is absurd. But second, we had people who thought they had an analogy, and the analogy that they thought was the wrong analogy, but it was an analogy that they thought was great because it provided a quick and easy answer to what to do. They believe, people ask, I was in the government at the time, I can tell you. The question was, well, have we ever had a situation where we've had a defeated totalitarian enemy? And the answer was, yes, we have. Good news, it's Germany in 45. The problem is Russia and these other countries in 1992 had absolutely nothing to do with Germany in 1945. First, it is a whole lot easier to get people to change if you got more guns than they do on their territory and they've admitted they lost. Please note, no Western official, no American president of either political party has ever said that the Soviet Union lost the Cold War. They talk about who won, but not who lost. We've never insisted that they admit they lost. That's a big deal, because what we in effect said, we're not going to treat you as a defeated thing. We're going to give you a pass, OK? Uh, second, we refused to deal with the problem that, you know, how long had Germany been fascist? 12 years. Who's the first chancellor of Germany after uh, we set up West, the Western Zone in 49? Conrad Adenauer, who'd been the mayor of Cologne before the Nazis took power. There is not enough yogurt in Los Angeles to have found anybody in any of these countries still alive to form a democratic state. And third, and this is the real stinker, because this continues to matter, we were not prepared, we didn't have anything that would justify the kind of investment it would take in any of these countries uh, to have a new Marshall Plan, the amount of money would be staggering, and we didn't have, we didn't, we didn't do what we did for Germany because we're such nice people. Although we are really nice people, we did what we did for Germany for the very simple reason that we were building a defense in depth against Soviet Russian imperialism in Europe, because that's what the Cold War was about. But we've denied all this because you know we did, now occasionally we look empirically, but not much. Second thing, we've got in Ukraine and all these other countries, all, everything has to be repurposed. That is to say, it has to be redefined. I think a much more important issue 
in Ukraine today are much more important action. Although it didn't get front page of the New York Times, so it can't be true. That can't be true. Was the decision to say we're not going to call World War II the Great Patriotic War again. That is a vastly more important ideological shift than tearing down the Statue of Lenin. Those are the kinds of things that are sustainable in this matter. But the big thing is to reclaim. Russians, in Tsarist times and in Soviet times, stole Ukrainian history. They lied about it and they, they managed to get win it out. They've managed to lie about it and win it so much that they've even managed to infect what many Ukrainians think about their history. Take a look at the faces of the people who were on the stamps and denominations of paper money in Ukraine, and you will suddenly find they are not in the top ten pantheon of Ukrainian national heroes. And there's a reason for that, okay? Um, we have to understand that for Ukraine to be a nation, it has to reclaim its own history. And that isn't just getting rid of Lenin, that's recovering a history you can use. And it is critically important to that Ukraine build a nation <coughs> so that the West cannot treat it as it continues to treat it as a country in between great powers. And we are still in that way. And what that means is that <coughs> nobody's terribly worried that statues of Stalin are going back up in Russia. But they're terribly troubled that statues of Lenin are going down. And it's because the standards that are used for great powers are different than the standards that are used for other countries. And Ukrainians have to deal with that, and it's not easy. Okay. Now, I believe that Ukraine, has, as part of that, has to overcome and tell the truth about something which some Ukrainians are afraid to talk about, and that is the pogroms and the Nazi crimes that took place on Ukrainian territory. Comrades. The pogroms before 1917 and almost all of the Nazi crimes in Ukraine were conducted by Russian speakers, if not ethnic Russians, rather than by Ukrainians. It's about time the Ukrainians said that, rather than simply avoiding the issue. Were there some Ukrainians who did bad things in both cases? Yes. Were they responsible for those things? No. And a country needs to know its heroes, and it also needs to know its evil people, too. That's part of recovery. Now, I believe, to finish, I believe that Ukraine is about something very much bigger than Ukraine. It is about the defense of Europe and European values. I believe that Ukraine is doing something which deserves universal support, people of goodwill and decency. And that is, it is attempting to create a nation which is secular, civic, and European. And I will add just this. If Ukraine succeeds in doing that, as hard as it will be, that will be a more effective weapon against Russian imperialism than anything else they can do. Because it calls into question the fundamental assumption of Vladimir Putin and the fascists who are running the Russian government at present. And that is the view which too many Americans, including some who have even taught at NYU, uh, believe that somehow Slavs really aren't ready for democracy, which is a racist and wrong view. Ukrainians are demonstrating that Slavs are ready for democracy. And the failure of the Russians to move in the same direction means that what the Ukrainians are doing is important not only for their freedom, not only ultimately for Russia's freedom, but for our freedom as well. Thank you. Paul, to be here in the presentation, Paul is uh, much too humble to. Uh, bring a point to the forefront of the audience, and that is he is the only U.S. government official who resigned in protest to uh, President Bush's uh, Kiev speech, uh, where he basically told Ukrainians, uh, reconcile yourself to where you are within the Soviet system and remain under the thumb of Moscow. Uh, so that... Uh, that's quite uh, something for uh, a person within the beltway. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, I'll open it up uh, for questions for uh, to whichever of the panelists here. Uh, yes, please. I'd like to start with your question by, uh, by addressing the very important question you raised about symbolism and especially the evolving excuse me, national conscious, especially in Central and Eastern Ukraine. So Kharkiv, Anastasia, uh, is a very interesting city. You come from there, so you know a lot about it. Uh, I happened to be in Kharkiv six months ago during the election of Poroshenko. I was struck by how many young people, well-educated, great schools in Kharkiv, uh, were still steeped in the mindset that they would say, they would say that they equated the terrorists and bandita, bandits in Kiev, the US heroes, with the terrorists and bandits in Donetsk. So my, and, and it was only you know, uh, eight months afterwards that, that the Statue of Lenin finally came down, a long, long time. So my question to you is, uh, what's happening in the second biggest city in Ukraine, Kharkiv, dominated by Russian-speaking you know, people who are just now maybe, maybe starting to uh, change their minds? I have to say that the amount of thought that went into Tremendous, and so much uh, of Ukrainian identity was suppressed during the Soviet times. Um, so, uh, from uh, from the speech of Paul, we can definitely understand that nation building will take a long time. Uh, but I place a lot of hope in my city uh, because uh, uh, I I've lived there for full. 16, 17 years and have communicated with different people, um, many are still uh, afraid to speak uh, loudly about uh, their, uh, where, where they belong. Uh, during Soviet times it was very common to not to speak or to really think, otherwise you would go to Siberia or somewhere else, you would no, no longer live. Uh, so, um, Many of my friends, uh, approximately the same age as I, uh, uh, they speak Russian because that's a very common language uh, in the city. Uh, uh, but from the conversations uh, I've had, uh, especially since I've been coming home for all the holidays uh, and had the chance to communicate with my peers, uh, people uh, especially of my age, I think it's very important. They become more and more conscious of where they belong. And uh, so many of them told me that, yes, uh, I speak Russian, but I consider myself Ukrainian. And uh, this uh, this is very important. Despite, uh, it doesn't matter which language you speak, it doesn't really matter uh, what kind of ethnic background you have. So many people stood together uh, during Maidan protests in Kyiv and in my city, Kharkiv. Um, I attended the Maidan in Haku when I was there during winter break and uh, I saw different people come of different ages and they all stood together. And I have to say from the very beginning it was very scary because nobody really knew what would happen. Police could just rain on, down on people and or people might disappear. But every day people came and every day they became more and more confident and so many more people started uh, breaking the Ukrainian flag and uh, the Trezuk sign. and. Um, Acknowledging that they want to see Ukraine as independent uh, country with their uh, with uh, with its own goals, separate from the past uh, ideology. Uh, yes, please. A question to uh, uh, Paul Gold. Uh, Russia, throughout history, uh, trumped Slavic card to justify its expansionist policies uh, into the European heartland, and for. Throughout the communist period, uh, the face of communism was the Russian face. However, uh, Russian longevity covered around 60 years of age. Uh, the more west you go, the less Russian Russia becomes. And Russia is a huge magnet for Central Asian uh, peoples and other peoples of non Slavic identity. In the long term, what's the Russia's future in the Slavic nation? Russian. The Russian Federation will not be in these borders within five years. Uh, it probably won't be in these borders within one. Um, the Russian Federation is an unsustainable entity. There are Russian communities uh, who are quite capable of becoming vibrant, liberal, democratic 
free societies. The greatest tragedy in the history of Russia was Moscow's defeat of Novgorod in the end of the 15th century. Because Novgorod in 1480 was the most liberal and democratic and participatory government in Europe. There was more vote, there, there was a wider franchise in Novgorod than there was in London at the same time. Uh, it's not that Russians are somehow extra gene for bad things. The fact is, it's the Muscovites. Uh, Moscow has to be defeated. Moscow has to be contained. Moscow built itself into an empire, and it built an empire before the Russians became a nation, which is the great tragedy, by selling out to the Mongol hordes. You may have heard about the stories that Putin wants to build a bunch of Orthodox churches in the Kremlin. What you may not know is that when the Kremlin was built, there were 17 mosques there for the Mongol hordes, people who came to get the money that Moscow collected as the tax, as the bagman for the Mongol horde. The problem is not the the problem is that Russia is a country that's unsustainable except as an authoritarian system, and at some point authoritarianism doesn't work. If oil, if oil continues to be down at 30 and 40 dollars a barrel, Russia will disintegrate. We will have an independent Siberia, we will have an independent Idel Ural, we will have independent countries in the North Caucasus, and we will have several nominally ethnic Russian formations in European Russia. This is, the, what Americans don't like geography because geography is about history and culture and we don't like those things either. And ultimately they don't want to buy maps uh, because new maps mean you have to learn new things. I was down at the National Defense University in Fort uh, McNair in Washington not long ago. They had a map that still showed the Soviet Union. I mean, they were ready and rested if the Cold War came back. It's not coming back. <laughs> um, the, more, the more violent, the more Putin attempts to take things back, the less that will be left of that country as a result. Because the pressures that tore it apart in 1991 are being reconstituted within the borders of that place. It is not just that Russians have a demographic disaster on their hands in terms of the ethnic Russians, although they do, and in some places it's much worse than 60. In Pskov Oblast, um, which is a Russian oblast just east of Estonia, a life expectancy for Russian males in rural areas is now 38 um, because the local governor ended uh, the supply of insulin, uh, and so people who had diabetes, which is to say large numbers of vodka drinking adults, uh, die. Um, you know, it happens. I don't think that the Russian Federation is sustainable, and I think that we had better get ready uh, for big changes. And I'll give you my one and only good piece of advice that I give to every audience I speak to. Don't buy any maps. <laughs> buy stock in companies that print maps and you'll make <laughs> That's what I've done. <laughs> let, let me suggest the following. Uh, uh, just one second, please. Yeah. If you look at a map, if you get yourself to do that, you're going to see that Russia, what we call Russia or Russian Federation, is the largest country in the world. It's about one seventh of the Earth's land mass. It spans, well, it used to be 12 time zones, now it's 11 because of the juggling of time zones. It encompasses the entire northern one-third of Asia. Think about that real, real hard. How does one political entity become that huge? And what is the brittleness that is suggested by that? If Ukraine in its totality is about 2.5% the territory of the Russian Federation, then you got to believe that the developments in Ukraine and the taint that Ukraine presents for Russia in terms of its ability to control internal events in Russia and the winds of change and democracy that Ukraine has always represented, uh, that is one huge reason for uh, the actions of uh, Putin and his followers in Right. Just look at a map and think about it, and how is it that Russia became as huge as it did? It fought 37 wars, two were defensive, 35 wars were offensive. 
Yeah, no, please. Can I, can I jump in? Because I want to just two footnotes on that. First, you should realize that Russia is not, the Russian Federation was drawn by negation. Stalin drew everybody else first. And the borders don't make sense at the graphic, political, or economic. But more important, for a country to be held together, you need, you need integuments. You need roads, you need rail systems, you need airlines. The Russian Federation, the largest country on earth, has fewer miles of paved highway than my home state of Virginia. How do you hold a country together when you don't have highways? And while it will change, Putin is telling the truth next year, it is still the case that the road that connects the two largest cities of the Russian Federation, Moscow and St. Petersburg, is a two-lane road. Now, driving I-95 feels like a two-lane road, but imagine if it was still Route 1 here, how you would manage to keep New York part of something called the United States. It, it can't be done. It's simply not there. And most people don't live in most of it. The northern third of the country is almost unpopulated. It has a current population of about two and a half million, of whom about 70% are not Russians. And it's and the, those numbers are getting worse from Moscow's point of view. Yeah. Ivanka. Oh. <laughs> I don't start with that. <laughs> My question is uh, to Nastya, and uh, we had many discussions about this topic, and uh, I'm just wondering, because my personal experience when I saw, in similar circumstances, when I saw Soviet symbols in Columbia University was, as I saw, Nazi symbols. So how, how about your reactions? And I was honestly shocked to that extent that I actually didn't even bring to my uh, to the administration's attention, uh, this mayor. And how about your feelings? And what do you think is next uh, in that respect? My second question is to Emily. Um, I'm just going to play a devil's advocate and uh, ask about that woman on that picture. Because what we saw that people actually said that the monument should be erected to the people who died defending democracy. So. How can you consciously decide whether that woman was mourning something different than uh, that those heroes? And what if her past and her relatives had actually similar experience as Nastya's uh, grandparents? And uh, can we consciously say that that's what she was mourning the Soviet past? And if so, what? In what context? Maybe she was mourning her use. And thank you. I think that given the brutality of the Soviet regime, there's nothing that prevents us from equating uh, the viciousness of the symbols to the Nazi swastika. Uh, the, the symbols that represent the Soviet regime, they represent the government which tried to wipe out all the differences in all the, all the religious and, and national uh, identity differences between people and make them all one submissive group of Soviet people who would be like the, the were called hammers. Dip, dip, dip. Performing all the orders from the government above and nothing else. And the big problem is that this has not been properly acknowledged so far. So bringing it to the level of, acknowledge, of acknowledgement uh, and treating it as Nazi symbols I think would, would be would be important step to uh, to understand the horror of the regime past. Uh, I actually anticipated somebody asking that question when I put that photo up, um, and the, the the real reason, which is very ethnographic, that I made the definitive decision to present her as mourning for Soviet past was because I did not even notice that that sign was there until I looked at the photos, meaning that her, her behavior and her emotions were so powerfully ignoring that that was even there, it, it didn't even seem relevant, right? Um, and the other reason is because this is, the photo was taken in late February, and there were flowers, and people were still putting flowers on my dad daily, all the time, new flowers. And she was not, when she left, she walked up Shevchenko Boulevard. She didn't walk toward my dad, she didn't walk anywhere else that there were monuments to the Heavens 100 or any, anything else having to do with my dad. 
Um, and it's that those things made it seem very clear to me that she was um, she was really there for Lenin. That being said, I I could totally be wrong and be misinterpreting it, but I am sure that at least one other person in Ukraine has a story that would fit into my anecdote. Um, but I do think that you are possibly extremely right in this idea that she is warning this youth that she has romanticized and idealized in her head as this um, totally wonderful thing that she can never have again when she maybe didn't understand what the political regime was doing, right? She sees that she has school and friends and she can participate with all these social groups and that's what she remembers and those things she remembers positively. So when she sees Lenin, she's reminded of her little red star pin or something like that instead of um, reminded of some kind of atrocities. So obviously there's a lot of room for interpretation um, and I do think it's important to, to recognize that. Um, but I also do, I am relatively convinced that this woman is not the only example of this type of thing. And we have a question we have a question from uh, Duke University and uh, from Mr. Orishkevich, Dr. Orishkevich, who is asking uh, Mr. Gobel, uh, what three top recommendations would be for Ukraine from your perspective? Well, let me preface that by adding to what's just been said. I'm very close to being a First Amendment absolutist. I believe that the way to deal with bad speech is with more good speech. I think it's a whole lot more serious that large numbers of American academics publish outrageous books whitewashing Stalin and the Soviet system than that somebody has a party where they put the Soviet flag up. I think this tendency in American universities and elsewhere to ban things is wrong. It's inconsistent with our national values and it will be inconsistent ultimately with Ukrainian democracy if the Ukrainians go down. My recommendations for the Ukrainians are, are very simple. Ukraine is looking down a barrel of a gun. It has one duty, and that is to survive as a state. That means that a lot of things that are desirable can't be done right now because there simply isn't enough mental energy. Uh, it is absolutely essential that Ukraine be supported by the Western powers. I've called in writing Ukraine to be a member of NATO preemptively. I've been working with members of the Congress to get a real honest to God non-recognition policy about Crimea. The United States will never recognize the Russian Anschluss of Crimea. I believe that Ukraine unfortunately is up against Western governments that don't want to do it. Uh, and who are only too pleased to talk about the need for economic reform, fighting corruption, or dealing with this or that side issue. When you are attacked, as Ukraine is being attacked, and your national, your national survival is at risk, and make no mistake, Putin will kill any number of people. He doesn't care. This is a vicious, vicious fascist leader. And we have got to stop acting as if it's business as usual. And the Ukrainians need to stop acting as if it's business as usual. What I urge when I was director of research at Radio Liberty, what I urge my analysts to do on many occasions is to put whatever they were writing in, in another context so they would see how absurd what they were pushing forward. Imagine how people would think today of some members of Congress or senior prominent American academics urging Warsaw to step up the battle against corruption when the Fairmont was moving toward Warsaw and Krakow in 1939. Uh, we would consider that to be absurd and ridiculous, but we don't take those people on. And I, I wrote something saying uh, that Ukraine should, that. Fighting corruption is a good thing, it would be a good thing for Ukraine to do, but you can't do everything immediately. Keeping the country as a single whole is more important. And I was attacked for that more than anything I've written in the last six months, because people desperately want any excuse they can find not to help Kiev against an aggressive Moscow. The only thing that's good about this there's only one good thing. The more Putin takes back 
what was the Soviet Union, the more he recreates the possibility for the destruction of the place into even more and smaller units. Because he will recreate with a much nastier and less defensible ideology uh, something that cannot be governed and will fall apart. Tom Ilvis, the president of Estonia, has elegantly put it uh, that if the Russians come back this time, they won't be constrained by communism. And we're already seeing that in Crimea and the Donbass. If you want to see the true horror that is waiting for Russians, look at Crimea, which is, which is much more horrific now than any place in the Russian Federation, but it is being done by what Vladimir Putin wants for the future. Why we do not cover this, why we do not broadcast it in, I, well, I do know, but I find it unconscionable. And I think Ukraine has to mobilize its entire population, strip the country, uh, need be, to build a sufficient force so that enough Ukrainians will die that finally the people in Brussels will decide we have to do something. Because that's what it will take. I'm sorry to say that. Because if we go on as we are, Ukraine is going to be sliced salami tactic by salami tactic until there are Russian troops in Lviv, which will probably be renamed Putin Uh No, I mean, I, I'm sorry. It, it, all the other things are nice, but it's like if you have a heart attack, anyone who says, yeah, but we should really take care of that ingrown toenail. Forgive me. No doctor who said that would keep his job. Fortunately for members of our foreign policy establishment, making equally outrageous statements uh, doesn't get you in trouble. It probably gets you promoted. There was a question, young lady, back there, please. Hi, my name is Dora Comey. Thank you for all of your comments. And since there is such a huge job in front of Ukraine, as a lot of people said, I'm curious to hear from last year what your response was when you came back from NYU Abu Dhabi and talked about your experience both with the weird Slavic night thing and how you addressed it with the administration. What is your peers and fire kids react to both of them? Since it's up to the Ukrainians. I, to my memory, when I came back home in summer, um, I, I didn't talk much with people about this uh, because I got engulfed in so many other issues that were happening in the country at the moment. Um, and uh, seeing basically the war happening, uh, I was more following news on that. Uh, also, I just got into a bit of a different mindset coming back home for the holidays, so I gave myself time to think about it and not to actively engage in it all the time, to let it rest and maybe get some more thoughts on the topic. Uh, but now that I'm back in the academic phase, uh, uh, well, I'm very glad that we're having this discussion, so hopefully more things will stem from that. Um, and uh, I do wish that this conversation, of course, goes back to Ukraine, because that's the point, that Ukrainians back at home deal with their legacy. Um, and I think it's important to bring the conversation in this sort of intellectual venue when we discuss uh, uh, it from many different perspectives and, and discuss it in an intellectual way, which is more conducive to proper policy back at home. Uh, yes, uh, on, on my right here, please. Uh, Mr. Bobo, I think you're probably old enough as I am to remember a series of Part series the National Review by Joe Sober trying to equate communism with nationalism. Do you remember that? I do. Can you perhaps answer the question? Are we closer to making that equation work? No. For the benefit of, no. I think, most young people here who don't know who Joe no. Sober is. No, we're, 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 we're not any closer. Why not? I think uh, the the best explanation is from Bob Conquest, who no one could accuse of being pro-Soviet, uh, the author of the great terror, terror family, and so forth. What Bob Conquest said when he was asked 
exactly the question. You know, are these the same, or was you know was Stalin worse than Hitler, or was Hitler worse than Stalin? Congress said they were both evil. Comparative evil doesn't get you very far. But at least for aesthetic reasons, that was conquest term, not mine, for aesthetic reasons, Hitler was worse. Um, partially because Stalin was, while well, he killed far more people, and he was responsible for Hitler starting the war in Europe, and he was responsible for the Soviet Empire and much else. Uh, he presented it in a rational, in a, in a rational discourse. You know, I mean, it was presented. If people were killed because they were resisting economic change, they were killed because they were members of this or that social class. Uh, they weren't presented, although that he was certainly guilty of it in a number of cases. Half of the 16, 18 deported peoples because they were members of an ethnic group. And the view, I think, in Western societies has always been that you can change your social class, but you can't easily change your ethnicity. So if somebody comes at you and wants to kill you because you're a member of an economic group, you could change your economic group. Uh, if somebody comes in and wants to kill you because you're a member of an ethnic group, uh, there's not a lot you can do. And I think conquest gets it as close as we're going to get. My own, my own view is that comparative evil is not a subject that we get very far. I believe that Stalin and Hitler were monsters. I believe they were both monsters. I find the issue trying to decide, you know, which one is worse is, it doesn't get us very far. And I, while I would not, at the end of the day, use exactly the terms conquest does, I think those get us closer to, to the explanation you're, you're looking for. But, excuse my, excuse my expression, I don't think that's what Sober was getting at, as far as I can remember. And I take offense to conquest and I, especially since he was the one who did the research on the Great Famine, which murdered people simply because they were ethnic, not because... No, that's not true. That is not okay, true. First of all, read read Conquest's book, and you'll find out that the yeah. Well, where did the where did people also die as conquest of Kazakhstan, and western southwestern Russia? That he was he was destroying the peasantry. There were more Ukrainian peasants than anyone else, and he was destroying them. I don't agree with everything Conquest says in that book, but it was done in that. Your question to me was not Sobrin's analysis, but have we moved beyond? gotten closer to being accurate now, and I, the answer is, I don't Correct. think so. Correct, and, and I appreciate that, but what I'm getting at is that Sobrin, as I am today, maybe I should have okay. rephrased that, is not to make that equation work. But the question is for social optics, political optics, what Anastasia was concerned about, the symbolism. Why is it that this evil, not because of its nature, was equal to Hitler, but because it was equally evil. Oh, because there's a very quick answer to that. That's what I want to hear. The real quick answer is the United States never was an ally of Nazi Germany. And if we posited, if we were willing to deal with just how evil the Soviet system really was, we would have to confront the decisions that were made that we took about what we did. And that is not something we are going to do unless compelled to, okay? It's just not gonna happen. Uh, you know, the, the line at 22nd and C is we may make a mistake sometime, but we are never wrong. And one of the things we're not about to admit is that we formed an alliance with a man who killed more people in the world than anyone in history except possibly Mao Zedong, okay? We're not gonna admit that. Moreover, the, as evil as the Soviet system is, was and is in the minds of a lot of people, it was presented as a rationalist response. It was evil and ugly. I, you know, I don't yield to anyone on that, okay? I don't want to have anything to do with it. But 
it was never presented as an irrational thing. Stalin never gave a speech in which he says, we've got to kill a bunch of, of Ukrainians. He never gave that speech. No, he, no, no. He didn't give that speech in any record we have, okay? If you want to believe that he took the decision on collectivization to destroy Ukraine, that's fine. I disagree, but one can, one can think, conclude that. But the fact is, he was making an argument in the kind of rationalist language that was much more difficult for people in the West to contest than what Hitler was doing. Because Hitler was presenting an image of true horror. And one of the things, one of the reasons I'm convinced Vladimir Putin is going to go down, and I hope he goes to the Hague, where he gets to spend time in the Milosevic Memorial cell, is that Vladimir Putin has forgotten how dangerous it is to start talking about whole categories, whole nations as evil in the way that that Stalin was always careful not to do. And I think we will see even Americans wake up to that eventually. But I'm not optimistic in the comparative evil business that we're going to move beyond where we were 35 years ago. I don't think we can. We have to. Okay, okay. Let's, let's, let's move on. We have other questions here. I believe uh, we had a question from that gentleman back, please. Uh, my name is Andre. And I'm actually sorry to be one of the latest proponents of the elimination of Lenin's symbols from Ukrainian history and Ukrainian culture very early. I grew up in Western Ukraine, and grew up in Kastikis in Ukraine, in the And this is actually the particular region that for centuries had nothing to do with Russia, and had nothing to do with Lenin, but still had such a big influence on Soviet culture, even, I think, bigger than the other Western Ukraine. And I actually, my original street address was Lenin Street, and very early, I started to feel very uncomfortable with the idea that uh, I just didn't realize what the, this person has to do with my region. And this street was renamed to Hushevskoy Street about 10 years ago, but people still call it Lenin Street. Because people in such distant communities from here don't realize why it's very important to forget about Lenin. And then I would say, because I, I wasn't, the last time I was in Ukraine was not that long ago, that about 50% of Ukrainian population still does not realize why it was that important to kick out Lenin from the center of Kiev. And 25% out of these 50% does not agree with it. So the question is directed to any of the speakers. Uh, how do you think it is important to make younger generation realize that it is very important to get rid of the material part of Soviet culture, how to persuade them that it is really important to eliminate violence. Because new Ukrainian authorities uh, have nothing to do with it. They don't discuss this topic anymore. So how do you think we should do that so that we would make younger generation realize that it is very important and make 100% of the Ukrainian population realize it? The people who eliminated Lenin, they do it. I, I, I would, I think that there are, that you make, you talk about two different uh, things that I think should be kept separate. One is, how does any government go about the business of enlightening its population about the horrors that have been visited upon it and somebody else? And I believe that that should be an integral part of the educational system of, of Ukraine. I believe that the government should sponsor research on this. Uh, I believe that they should they should uh, make sure that uh, uh, there are days to remember the, many of the horrors that were visited upon the Ukrainian people. The sec and that I think is you know one can imagine how that's going to be done over time. It'll take time, but it'll happen. The second thing you talked about at the very end is how do you make Ukrainians view the people who took down the statue as heroes? That's a very different, that's a very different thing. That is, a, that is a conclusion that one hopes people will draw after they know enough about what Lenin was. But for the government to go get in the business of declaring heroes and enemies gets you down the same Bolshevik approach. I, I believe 
that when, as more and more Ukrainians know more and more about the horrors of their system, the, the, the Soviet system under which they live, more and more of them will reach the reasonable and proper conclusions. Okay? I think that you want people to reach those conclusions without didacticism and without censorship uh, and without giving orders. Because if you do it otherwise, you will find often that it's counterproductive. And um, the, um, uh, I, I don't think the government should be in the business of declaring heroes and enemies. I, do, I don't like enemies of the people. When it's talked about, I don't quite like heroes either. I mean, I, I think you, the government should be promoting broader understandings. I mean, I think even Americans would have trouble coming up with the top 50 heroes of American history. Uh, I think we would really, that would be hard. And we would probably not like the commission that formed to come up with those that list. We fight about it. Please. Uh, I want to maybe bring it back to uh, symbology and uh, finding out where the demarcation is. And I'd really like to hear not to take on this and Emily as well, um, uh, because there's a number of points that Professor Colby brought up that that uh, bring things to mind. So not only did the Lenin of Five happen, but you know, there was also the removal of the statue of Kutuzo in Western Ukraine as well. Uh, by the nature of Bolshevism, a lot of things were cleared out of imperial uh, uh, grandeur, and a lot of things were named after Lenin, and a lot about the, the glory of the Komsomolska and everything. Um, but, uh, but there are vestiges of colonialism throughout the Eastern European sphere. Uh, you brought up Kadi before with the statue, Professor Kobel, but uh, very close to that is the Alexander Nevsky Cathedral, which was in, thought about for being taken down. Well, they don't want to. You want to know why? I know they don't. You know why they don't want to build tear it down? For one very simple reason. Sure. That, stitch, that cathedral was erected in honor of the Russian losses at Tsushima Strait in 1905. And Estonians say, for that they can have a cathedral. <laughs> but, there was, but, but there was, but there's a lot. There was a lot of discussion by nationalists about tearing it down. It wasn't. It was left in disrepair for a very long time. Uh, it, it, the the fact that it was left in disrepair, the Estonian state, unlike a lot of country, governments, doesn't go around providing money to religious denominations. The fact that it was not in good repair is the complete and total failing of the Russian Orthodox Church. But the reason I bring up uh, bring up that is because. Uh, Whereas symbology has a lot of factors to it, I'm not going to bring up language because that's a huge issue, but it is a part of post-colonialism. Uh, but religion is a big one. Uh, there was another Alexander Nevsky Cathedral built um, at the beginning of the 20th century, right in the middle of Warsaw. And that was destroyed pretty quickly with the events of World War II. But imagine, imagine what a giant Russian Orthodox cathedral would have been an issue for the Polish people right in the middle of Warsaw in a very, it's it in the middle of Parliament Square. So, uh, so there are there are issues with these post-colonial vestiges, whether it's Kutuzo being taken down after the revolution, uh, whether it's, whether it's, a, so where is the demarcation? Is it only Soviet symbology that that we uh, blame as something that cannot be tolerated because of the equivalent of the Or is there, is there more, uh, is there more to be discussed? Kirovohrad still hasn't, I mean, this is about Soviet, but Kirovohrad, they couldn't make up their mind about renaming an entire oblast after something that's not Soviet for 20 years. I mean, obviously there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but think about the number of places and, uh, and tributes to Peter the Great uh, throughout Ukraine and whether, you know, what's their place going further and how, how looking at the history of it. Of it. Well, history is, a, history is a screen. It's constantly changing. And we, we evolve. We, we, we change the names. I live in a small town in Virginia, Stanton. Uh, most of the names are from mid-18th century Britain. Uh, we're in the business now of changing some of the names to update them with some more recent American heroes. Uh, the, the question is, st this is always a political and messy process. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps if people don't lie, um, as the Russian government insists on doing. Uh, Crimea, for example, is not immemorially Russian, despite what Mr. Putin says. It's been part of Ukraine far longer than it was ever part of the Russian Federation. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it was 
and was uh, a conate uh, well before that. What do you choose to put up? I, I don't think that you come up with, you know, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. I think these are political things and they, they evolve over time. What I'm worried about, and this is what I tried to say in my talk, just repeat it very briefly, is I don't want to see a bunch of rules imposed by a new government that are just as rigid, but in a different, with a minus sign in front of them, as the rules that were imposed by an earlier government. When you do that, you don't move forward. What you do is simply go, th go in a circle. And that's why it's so dangerous to try to talk about this as a huge, I think the fact that uh, 2,500 of the 4,500 Lenin statues in Ukraine are still standing to this day. I think, that's, I think that says something, because in some places people don't give a damn, or they don't notice. I lived in Washington for years, and I don't know how often, but it wasn't very often, I thought about the meaning of Constitution ever. It becomes part of the scenery. It doesn't have any meaning at all. And I suspect, for a lot of people, some of these things do. And sometimes the monuments end up having new and wonderful significance. Um, let me give you one from Baku, because I lived there too. In Baku, uh, there is a wonderful statue of a woman throwing off the hijab that came back in early Soviet times. Well, this statue is now, as it happens, in front of the Bank of Iran. And every Azerbaijani I know says, isn't it wonderful that the Iranians have to pass that every day on the way to work? So it works all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd also actually like to comment because I think that that's an excellent question because we can't definitively answer where colonialism begins and ends, especially if we look at the Soviet Union through a colonialist lens, right? That makes it extremely complicated. So I think you made a very incisive point here. Um, and I, I want to answer with, a, with an anecdote that turns your question around as I'm called to talk to you. Um, so there's this town called Hadjic, which is in Popovska Oblast. And I visited this town as part of a project to help educate teenagers about uh, tolerance and anti-discrimination projects and this sort of thing. Um, and there's a there's a Alea Pumyatniki, so it's like a park that has monuments. Uh, and it's, it's really well known. And so what the, the students did was to ask different people in the town about the, the park, what monuments they liked, what they didn't like, uh, what was the most meaningful, all kinds of questions. And of course, there's all sorts of answers. So there, when I was there, which was also in December, there was a gigantic Lenin statue. It was the biggest one I've ever seen. Um, and most of the other monuments were Soviet-era monuments. So monuments to the, now not great patriotic war, but World War II. Um, monuments to Afghanistan veterans from the region, monuments to Chernobyl liquidators. Uh, almost everybody picked the Chernobyl monument as their favorite one. Interestingly, also built with Soviet funds, also built under the Soviet Union, but very much more representative of the people who lived there um, than any of the other monuments, and that's why I spoke to them. There's also, this is just a funny funny part of the story, there's a bus of um, Drahmanov, the Ukrainian philosopher, lived in this town. There's a bust of a guy with a beard and, and hair, and uh, in Soviet time, of course, it was named Marx. And when the Soviet Union ended, they scraped off all the letters and they said, Drahamanov. <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, these, these I, I call these things like political bodies, right? But uh -huh. these, these bodies, these forms are used in political ways. And I, I think uh, the, the relationship that everybody had to these monuments is really representative of exactly how complicated the question is. Uh, and by the way, I talked to one of my friends from Hadesh in February and Lenin is now gone. So, I would just like to add to, uh, to your question that uh, I very much agree with uh, Professor Lobel on the point that uh, we need, in Ukraine, we need to give people time to think who they are because uh, with all these years, 70 years under the Soviet uh, regime, people were never given a chance to independently think of themselves. Of themselves, so they were given labels, and they had to accept those labels because if they did not, they were enemies of the regime. Uh, so people need to do their own research to get to know uh, their roots, and then uh, it's a matter of local communities, I guess, to see how they would like their streets to be renamed and how they would like to change the monuments. So. It's a matter of every community doing their local research and in this way uh, finding a new identity in the independent country for themselves. Mm -hmm.
Good question. Um, so you discussed, uh, you all discussed basically the events in Ukraine. On the other hand, what we witnessed in Russia, and I think Professor Gobel uh, touched on this lightly, uh, the resurrections uh, of the Soviet past and uh, Dzerzhinsky monument uh, going back in Lubinka, which is a scary, uh, you know, thought uh, just uh, to process. And uh, again, and we have witnessed the Sochi Olympics, which was very bizarre experience. And we, it didn't end up, I don't believe it ended up in New York Times. Uh, people can correct me. So what's your take? Because basically, from where I'm standing, I, I think it's people in Ukraine are rejecting the Soviet past in a, in different ways, and we discussed those ways. Where people in Russia or some segments uh, of the society in Russia are really embracing the Soviet past. How would you uh, kind of? Well, that's explain? a huge, huge question, but very quickly. People said in Soviet times, the Russians were communized, the non-Russians were communized and Russianized. Um, and a lot of Russians believe, and they've been told that by their glorious president, who said that the destruction of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century, uh, that good things were true before 1991, and that the bad things that have happened now are all somebody else's fault. Uh, this is a convenience in many populist uh, 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 rhetoric in our own country as well as others that, that we will define what's good and bad. Um, the, the sense, the Russians were, they feel abused they and they want to strike out. I don't think it's true that you're, talk, you're seeing a widespread uh, desire to put statues of Lenin. What you're seeing is a desire to put statues of Stalin and Dzerzhinsky. Dzerzhinsky hasn't gone back in front of the Lubyanki yet, and the proposal to put the statue is a much smaller one, which is being paid for by the Russian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchate, another wonderful institution. Um, uh, I think the um, I don't think I don't think what we're what what Putin wants is is a return to communism. I think what he wants is something much worse, which is a fascist regime of extreme aggressive nationalism that is openly directed against minorities and neighboring peoples uh, in a way that Stalin might have approved of, but that at least Lenin and most of the time Stalin in public weren't prepared to say. So what this man is far worse, and what he is on offer to the world is far worse. Tragically, Western governments no longer have the resources, relative resource advantage they had earlier, although the oil price changes that helped them change that, uh, to be willing to stand up to it. Although I must say, if you look at Angela Merkel's transformation over the last three months um, and her statement the day before yesterday that Germany will, as part of NATO, defend the Baltic countries. That's an amazing thing. She had never said that before. And Putin, I think, has gone a bridge too far. Um, that's good. <laughs> uh, a question back and then another one up here. I'm not getting any questions from my right here. Am I missing somebody here? Perhaps behind the, uh, the, uh, the screen right now? OK, please. A question on anthropology. And we're going to have to tie this up in about five minutes, so if it could be quick, please. Um, Ukraine clearly never existed in its current borders. Um, some might say that some parts of Ukraine are more Polish or Hungarian, and more Eastern parts of Ukraine are more Russian. Uh, I've also heard an analogy that people of Eastern Ukraine have a Russian soul drafted in Ukrainian body. So from what you've seen, how do people perceive themselves in Eastern Ukraine? Are they more Ukrainians, Russians, or an amalgam of both, or it depends on where the power is? Mm. Mm. As an anthropologist, I can't definitively answer that question. No, I, I just a little bit. Most of, um, I mean, as, as, I, as I mentioned, most of my research took place in Ukraine following the start of Maidan. And I think that this had a large impact on the number of people that I interacted with who I made sure to identify first as Ukrainian and second with 
where their parents were from or what language they spoke at home and that sort of thing. Um, I can't exactly be sure, having not done, done extensive research and asked those same people the same question in a different context, but I talked to a lot of people from Eastern Ukraine who had come to Kiev for the protests and who would speak to me in Ukrainian um, because, you know, they, they knew that was like kind of the more right language to speak in at the time. And I know a lot of people who I met before a few years ago who, who really weren't confident in Ukrainian, who were from Eastern and South, Southern, Southeastern Ukraine. Um, and, and who now are much more fluent in Ukrainian. So I guess I think that it's, first of all, dangerous to suggest that any part of the country should always be identified in a certain way, right? Like that Eastern Ukrainians have this kind of soul and that kind of body or whatever. Um, I guess I think that it was really interesting the number of people who made it very clear to me how they identified, and it was always when they identified first as Ukrainian. Um, and a lot of them, you know, were Russian-speaking families and had Russian parents from Russia, but would engage with me in Ukraine. So, I, I thought let, let me make a comment on that uh, for those who are not versed in Ukrainian history, but it's an interesting anomaly, perhaps, that the genesis of modern Ukrainian national identity, by modern I mean in the 19th, mid to the late 19th century, was rooted in eastern Ukraine, and specifically in Kharkiv. And it moved west. And the evisceration of national identity in eastern Ukraine and Kharkiv and other regions, in large measure, was the result of the ethnic cleansing that occurred in that part of the country. And a large part of that was rooted in the man made famine that Stalin perpetrated in 32 and 33 and the consequential resettlement primarily of ethnic Russians into those regions of Ukraine and thereafter as well into other regions largely as a reward for retirees from the KGB, the military, so on and so forth. Uh, this is a phenomenon that was predicted by the Vice Council of uh, the Royal Embassy of Italy and their consular office in Kharkiv in 1933 where he predicted that the destruction of 10 million or so Ukrainians during the famine would result in a total colonization by Russia of eastern Ukraine and a total loss of Ukrainian self-identity. That was back in 1932. But don't, don't, footnote, don't make the mistake that Americans almost invariably do of assuming an identity or a par close parallel between language use and identity. There are just dozens of examples, maybe hundreds of examples around the world, where people give up their national language and then become nationalists. Ireland being Exhibit A, but there are lots more. And Ukrainian nationalism today, what makes it so powerful, is that Russian speakers are also Ukrainian nationalists. The equation of language and identity is typical of people who, come, who live in countries that are immigrant societies. It is not true in most of the world, and it is certainly not true in Eastern Ukraine, People were identified as Russian in Soviet times because it was a better thing to do. Now they identify as Ukrainians because it's a better thing living in Ukraine. But a lot of them who've made that identity shift actually believe it. And Canadians are really Americans because they speak English. <laughs> uh, I have time for, I'm sorry, I, I have a question from a gentleman here that, that I like to uh, accept questions from everybody clearly. But we have a full stop coming up. I'm sorry, the gentleman here, please. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, everybody, for uh, tonight. It was very interesting to listen to everybody and um, the questions from the audience. I just wanted, it's not really a question, I just wanted to tie just for the theme from the last two uh, questions that came about the, the monuments in, in Russia coming up, the Dzerzhinsky and Stalin, and then what you said about colonization by Russians of Eastern Ukraine. And I want to bring it back to Crimea. Because we talk about symbols, and then uh, also myths are also sort of built upon the symbols, and uh, those are the persist throughout the and um, the mythology uh, that Putin is skillfully using as Stalin, and his time managed to use, and his propaganda tactics are being resurrected now, <clears throat> very successfully by Putin. And uh, why Crimea? So Putin is pretty much taking us back to 19th century. It's not even Soviet what he's doing. He's taking us back to the Catherine II, who conquered Crimea, who started developing, trying to 
uh, make it Russian and uh, create this mythology about Crimea being the, the crown of the jewel, I mean jewel of the crown in, in the empire. And that's why it's symbolically important for Putin to conquer Crimea first, and now he's doing Eastern Ukraine, and he's doing step by step, and it's just so transparent, so obvious to anybody who knows history, as you said, you know, Americans don't like history or geography. Um, <clears throat> but, it, I mean, it's, uh, it's very obvious, but the way it's presented in the media, Russia today, the way it confuses issues, the way, and other, and Western media picks it up, and uh, unwittingly, and uh, it's just uh, all these uh, strands of uh, discussion we have today, they all come back to this, I think, and just um, create this mishmash of uh, um, confusion in, in many people who are not well versed with history and, and geography. I'll, I'll exercise my prerogative uh, as a petty dictator here and as a moderator <laughs> by leaving you with one final thought, which I touched upon earlier, and we did as well, and that is this. Uh, we know that after Hitler came to power in January 1933, uh, the Olympics took place under the swastika in Berlin. We saw uh, the Sochi Olympics, the hammer and sickle there, and before that, if you go back in your memory to the Olympics in Salt Lake City, you will see the introduction of Soviet symbolism with the jutting jaw and the proud stance of the uh, milkmaid and the iron worker uh, in typical Soviet fashion. Uh, the Soviet uh, Nazi Germany has been dead and buried for 75 years or so, and we really don't see any resurrection of that symbolism. Uh, 10, 11 years of uh, Nazi symbolism, 10 or 11 years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, of course, I mentioned the introduction of the Soviet anthem and other signals after that. That is the thought, that is the macro concern and the ripple effect and the implications that we have for global and national security interests over and beyond what it is that Ukrainians may or may not do with a statute or something else. So with that, thank you very, very much. And uh, I'm sure <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I got the guys.